looking to improve your life, brush up on your personal growth techniques, you are in the right place. Welcome to Life's Little Lessons with your host, author of Designing Your Own Destiny, Kevin A. Dunlap. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Life's Little Lessons. Today, I have a gentleman that I've actually known on and off for the last few years. I've been been in Vegas at the time of this recording of just under 14 years, and I'm going to have to say it's probably been at least maybe 10 years ago. I'm not exactly sure when I first met this gentleman. His name is... T.J. Kunica. Oh, hopefully I didn't say that. Cuenca. 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 Sorry about that. And he's the uh, the CEO and founder of a company called the Superhero Foundry. And he's uh, what that is, is, is more like a martial arts education company. And I will go more into detail on that. Now, when I first met T.J., um, he was doing some stunt training. And, I, and, I, and when I first came to Vegas, I wanted to get back and do some stunt work. So I was actually working out at his at his home studio doing some martial arts training, doing sword fight, not sword fighting, knife fighting with the, I believe it was the uh, Filipino style mm-hmm. of knife fighting. So anyway, I do have TJ on the show today. TJ, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, TJ, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are, who are you and what is it that you do and why do you do that? Okay. Uh, well, we have a studio here in town. It's called the Superhero Foundry. Uh, it's basically the world's first superhero training center. And what that simply means is that uh, we have a belief that every human being has a unique skill, a unique talent that is, uh, is, uh, they're born with. Unfortunately, when a kid is running around too much and someone tells them to sit down, stop running around, if they talk too much, tell them to be quiet. In other words, everyone's put into a small box, and, and that box is how we live. And then one day we figure out, oh, my gosh, I'm actually a pretty good runner or I'm a pretty good speaker or I'm a pretty good skier, et cetera. But those skills and those talents have been, um, uh, have been uh, put in a box. So what we believe, since people have, uh, are geniuses in their own right, in their own different fields, uh, we try to find that one thing that makes them unique, one thing that makes them amazing, and we, we, ex- we expand it. We really work at it, and we, we use that skill in order to turn someone into quite literally a superhero. Okay. And which age groups are you mainly dealing with? Uh, in the past, we've had kids as young as four years old. It really depends on their maturity level. But we prefer uh, people as, as, as young as eight years old to infinity. All right. Because you do train uh, adults as well. Yes, that's true. Yeah. We have actually our clientele, we have more, more I'd say about 80% adults and only 20% kids. Oh, wow. I did not know that. I always thought you were more geared toward the children than you were to the adults. Yeah, originally we did, but it seems more adults have found the superhero genre of film and TV to be a lot more appealing. It's, it's an escape for them. And when they find out that there's an actual place where you can learn to live out your fantasies in the real world, and not just through comic books, they become very attracted to what we do, especially since what we do is not just cosplay. Yeah, we don't. It's, we call it cost function. Okay. Uh, and so it's it's functional cosplay where they do dress up, but what they wear isn't just foam and latex. It's actual Kevlar, is bulletproof material, uh, actual <laughs> armor, and they learn how to use real weaponry, but in in a way where it it fits what we call the the Batman's code. A Batman's code is that don't kill. You know, it's all about uh, helping the community, helping the people around you in a way that it'll, uh, it'll help the community without injuring people. So we have a very unique system of martial arts. Okay, because I've seen some of it before. I think I've been to one of your trainings with one, you and one of your, uh, one of your other co-trainers. I forgot the gentleman's name, but that, that was a couple of years ago. And yeah, I, I did enjoy that, that experience. And your studio is located here in Las Vegas. Um, now, I know your studio has other training facilities uh, in it because I know you and your wife are, are both uh, in competition. Uh, of, should I go ahead and say this? Yeah. Okay, during both the competition of knife throwing and what was the axe throwing, correct? Knife and axe throwing, that's true. Um, uh, we have a corporation and it's called Tribal Advantage Systems International. It's an LLC. And uh, because of this, we have two different corporate, two, uh, two different uh, companies under that corporation. And one is, of course, the Superhero Foundry, which I spoke about. And the second one is BladeAces.org. Uh, Blade Aces is a company that concentrates on, um, let's say we call them uh, precision action sports. So everything from knife throwing, axe throwing, double bit axe, 
uh, archery, addle, addle, spear, uh, boomerang, blow darts, throwing stars. It's basically a decathlon of different throwing sports, indigenous sports, where the skill of the individual uh, varies with different kinds of sports. And it attracts a very large group of people, I should say. Because not many people uh, can go to a studio and learn how to throw an axe from from multiple different di distances away. And sometimes, because I know there's a difference, I did not know this until you showed me, let's say if you're throwing a knife, at what distances are you holding the blade and what distances are you holding the handle? Because the correct. handle, you have to be uh, a, a different distance than you are with the with the blade side. Right. It's a uh, rotational throwing. So... Um, uh, we show people, of course, that uh, there are different types of knife throwing. One is rotational, where the knife is going to flip end over end. And um, uh, if you're holding it by the handle, uh, it's going to be different than if you're holding it by the blade because the rotation of the knife in the air is going to be different. So if I'm standing, let's say, at two meters from the target, I would be throwing by the blade based on my height and the length and the width of my blade. Uh, if I was standing at three meters, I would be throwing by the handle. Now, uh, my record is 52 feet uh, with a knife. Uh, so that is more by chance now because <laughs> you really can't throw a knife straight. The, the physics aren't there. I actually had my uh, good friend, Shirley, uh, who's a mathematician, sit there, watch me, film me, and calculate where I need to stand to be able to stick my knife, uh, including the arc of the knife, the height traje trajectory. There were a lot of things that we had to factor in, even the speed of how I threw it in order for us to come and calculate with, you know, with pretty close to, uh, to almost down to the foot where I need to stand. And that's it under ideal conditions inside your studio. Now, if you're outside with wind and other kinds you of elements. To, yes, you have, you have to take that into account, including where the sun is, because if it gets in your eye and where your landmarks are based on where I'm throwing, based on the height of where my blade should hit in the air. And there are no tape measures in the air, you know? Correct. And then uh, in a studio, you're on a concrete floor outside. You could be on a hill. So you're yes. throwing down or you're throwing right. up. <laughs> right. It's curvature of the earth. And as a matter of fact, one of the things we're doing with, with blade aces is that we're actually going to have some long-distance rifle shooting as well. So it's that's what we call precision action sports because long-distance rifle, pistols, uh, it all comes into play where they're all action sports, but it's based on hitting uh, bullseyes or targets. Okay. And you do this on a competition, on a competition level? Yes, yes. So Blade Aces is the first, uh, let's just say it's the first organization who's put all of these different disciplines together. And uh, it's quite interesting because we actually have a huge, probably the biggest uh, knife throwing uh, gig, let's just say, ever uh, to be put on that's going to be, uh, we're going to be holding uh, this August uh, at Sturgis at the Buffalo Chip. Uh, the owners of Sturgis, uh, of, it's this large, they have over a million people go through this place. So we're looking at no less than 100,000 people who will see our booth there. It's a 2,500 square foot booth. Oh, wow. It's, it's not small. <laughs> it's, it's bigger large... than your typical booth. <laughs> yes, it, and they actually sought us out. The, the, they actually heard about us because of my wife and I, our, our reputation, and uh, because we do, uh, going back to the business aspect, uh, we do a lot of um, networking as far as uh, we, we make sure we have YouTube videos, we have a YouTube channel. Uh, we're on Twitter, we're on, oh my goodness, Instagram, we're on Snapchat. So there's a lot of stuff that we've been very active in doing lately. In the past, all we had was Facebook and YouTube. Uh, and my YouTube video, I have a YouTube video that has over 700,000 hits on it uh, in nice. the last two and a half years, almost a million, not not quite there, not quite there. It's, it's gotten a little slower. Um, and the way we were able to do that was because I had a gentleman by the name of Stephen Campbell who not only understood Facebook and, uh, and YouTube, but he also understood the power of Reddit. And uh, by using uh, his uh, skills in creating, um, uh, 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 let's just say, uh, a buzz, where people were asking about, wow, this is a cool video, who is this? And he would link to that, and people would start more and more conversations. It created a chain reaction. In the beginning, that one video, which is a trick throw video, I do 13 different tricks, including throwing blindfolded between the legs, three knives at the same time, kicking a knife into a target, uh, you know, uh, several times. Uh, there's so many different videos there that we, we fashioned a video where it would be um, short. It's under seven minutes. We had a specific format, which we followed. 
So in that way, it was easy for people to view. It was entertaining without it wasting their time. Let's just say that. Uh, I think I have over 700,000 hits on there. And I have a whole 537 dislikes. We <laughs> which we laugh at at, at first you think, oh my gosh, somebody hates my videos. But if you look at it from a percentage point, it's 0. 0.008 of a percent. I mean, it's it's such a small amount. That's why I kind of laugh whenever I look at the number of people who dislike my video as opposed to the people who actually like the video. It's uh, it's a big difference. Yeah. And that's cool because you're talking about like viral marketing. In this case, almost like planned viral yeah. marketing because viral is viral. It's, it's, it's uncontrollable. But you, you're releasing something, like you, like you said, using these different channels to help promote who you are and, and, and what you do, as well as being on multiple different social media platforms. Yes. Uh, I'm, a big, I'm a big believer in a gentleman by the name of uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. And uh, I believe his Wine Library TV. I don't know if you're familiar with him, uh, but his, uh, his thing is uh, finding something that you're very passionate in and immerse yourself so much in the culture that all you can talk about is that. And you'll find an audience. Sooner or later, you'll find an audience that's most interested in your product. So it isn't about appealing to everyone. It's about appealing to those people who are interested in a particular niche that you offer. And uh, sooner or later, you'll find them. And with our niche, because of the whole superhero, the popularity of superhero movies and TV shows, et cetera, it's very easy for us to do that. All right, because that because uh, right now there's so uh, DC's putting out so much stuff. Marvel is putting out multiple different uh, films uh, per year with the whole Iron Man. Uh, side fr franchises yep. and uh, Captain America, then they've got the Thor, then they've got the Fantastic Four, the Avengers, oh, yeah. Yeah. and the DC's got the Batman, the Superman, now Wonder Woman, uh, Aquaman and now just became... Don't forget uh, Deadpool. And Deadpool. Yeah. Deadpool. I know Deadpool is one of your favorite characters. I've seen you in, your co in that costume a few times. <laughs> yeah, it's the highest, I think it was the highest grossing R-rated movie of all time. Yeah, so people think, wow, this is an R-rated movie, but it grossed so much because not only was it... Uh, it wasn't about the violence. It was about the comedy, of course. But the fact that uh, parents were sneaking their kids into this show because it was that funny and because the character is appealing because he's not a perfect person, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, he's an anti-hero, which, you know, Captain America, yeah, he's, but he's Mr. Perfect. And in today's society, you see a lot of people who are trying to uh, come back from, you know, from a fall from grace, let's say. So they're looking at characters who are not perfect and that's more appealing to the public than someone who's 100% perfect, let's just say. All right, because that's one thing, I, Deadpool is still one of my favorite superhero movies. I'm so glad Deadpool Tools has been, uh, is coming out very soon. And yeah. uh, Ryan Reynolds was a perfect uh, character for that. And I would agree that when, when I ask people what is their favorite superhero movie, they're usually saying, they don't even think about Deadpool. And I said, well, Deadpool is my favorite one. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, yeah. yeah, definitely. And, yeah. and, and I, I've even researched it a little bit. I don't know if you've done this, but I researched it a little bit for that one movie itself. And since great popularity is how many, how many movies does the actor actually do a they either call it breaking the fourth wall or in theater they call it an aside where the yeah. where the character actually addresses the audience yeah yeah and that's very very rare i mean it's because a movie is all about a story not about the uh the story and interaction with the audience uh, deliver interaction with the audience and and like you you and i both know that uh being in in film is one thing, but when you're in theater, it's a different story. And I worked at Cod Cirque du Soleil for three years as an actor there. And uh, being able to interact with the audience directly endears them to you because there's actual contact. And I believe that's one of the big driving forces for Deadpool as uh, for his appeal is because he interacts with the audience. It's the same thing that we do here at the studio when we're dealing with our students. I can always teach the classes and a basic instructor who stands up there very aloof and I can tell everybody what to do. Here's what you do and I just stand there. But instead, I'd like to develop relationships with my customers, uh, with my students. Uh, we don't even think of them as customers or clients. We actually think of them as tribal members. Uh, ergo, the name, you know, uh, our, our corporation, Tribal Advantage. Uh, we believe that everyone here uh, is part of the greater group. And, and because of that, because we treat people as our brothers or our sisters or our friends or, or, or their kids or our kids, 
there's a lot closer relationship. And because we have that, um, we give them that feeling that uh, they're important and they're important to us and they're part of the tribe, they're more likely to, you know, to, uh, they, they want us to succeed. They're, they're doing their best to make help, help us succeed. And, and, it's, and it's obvious with the way that they interact with us and the way that they try to get their, their friends to come in. Now, um, that being said, this is not really the easiest kind of martial art to get people into. And number one, it's very confusing. Uh, people look at our website, which, by the way, right now is, is under construction because we're adding more uh, uh, features to it. But uh, most people, when they refer look at our website, they don't understand what it is. It's like, you guys, what do you do? Do you throw knives? Do you do you fight? Do you do, you do tournaments? And so we're, we do all of that, and it's it's quite confusing. So one of the big things that we're doing with the website right now is I have I go through a a media company. Uh, it's a V Digital Media, uh, and um, one of my students, he became a student of mine after he came here. Uh, he's very interested. Uh, his name is Sasha. And uh, Sasha looked at my website and he says, it's too cluttered. When you go to it, you can't understand exactly what you do. There's so much stuff. So what we're doing now is we're, we're, what we're doing is he calls it making it grandma friendly. Okay. Meaning if somebody looked at the website, even your grandmother would understand it. So I said, okay, why is, why is that necessary? He said, it's because if you look at your cell phone, if most people do their mark their research on their cell phone, 80% of people do their on their cell phone and their attention span is anywhere from eight seconds to 12 seconds. That's fast. So if somebody pulls up your website, looks at it and can't figure out what you do between those eight and 12 seconds, they go on. Now, uh, Sasha's company, uh, was doing, they were doing their analytics and showing that they have people looking at our website, but the number of conversions we have was very low. And that led him to conclude, of course, that it wasn't the website, it wasn't that people weren't clicking on the website, it was that they weren't converting um, the call to actions, there weren't enough call to actions, uh, otherwise known as a call me now or subscribe or join, etc. The call to actions were insufficient. And number two, and most importantly, it wasn't clear what we do. So now this is a new, this is a current experiment that we're doing because we want to make sure that when, because I'm paying for this, <laughs> this marketing, we want to make sure that when people look at our website, they know what we're about. And number two, we make them feel as if they have to contact us in some way, shape or form. Okay. So those are the two things that we're really working on. Uh, in addition to that, of course, is all the, all the stuff that we're doing with TV commercials and, um, and uh, the TV show I told you about, the, the two TV shows that we're going to be involved in this year. Okay, and, and I, I was what he was talking about. That this is actually a previous conversation that TJ and I had a few months ago. Is what he's alluding to, because uh, he was talking about having a TV show. What, what, which channel was it? The, the first one? Well, there's there are two TV programs that are now in production. Uh, they're they're actually in the planning stages, and they're marketing it to different cut to different networks. Uh, one is about the superhero foundry, which is what we do, where we transform people and we, I can't really talk too much about it because it can be easily duplicated if they wanted to, but, uh, basically it's like a, it's like a makeover, but it's a superhero makeover okay. where people who are having struggles in their lives, et cetera, we help them go through it and we basically turn them into a superhero. Uh, the second show of course is, uh, about the blade aces where they're following my wife and I, as we travel around the world and compete in different uh, places and how it's and all these organizations on the precision action sports are coming together to create a, a, uh, an organization where it's pretty much like the Olympics of precision throwing. Uh, Melody and I have traveled let's see, this year, 2017, we were in uh, Hungary in Switzerland the year before that we were in Italy competing there. And then, England, France, this year, 2018, we're supposed to be in the Czech Republic in Russia. We would be the first couple, uh, American couple to ever compete in knife throwing in Russia. Unfortunately, it's at the same time that was going on with Sturgis. It's that pretty much that the week before. So we have to choose um, publicity or money. And money is winning out. <laughs> so <laughs> we're going to Sturgis because it is a huge uh, deal. That is, uh, it, that's 10 days. And uh, we're, we're guaranteed no less than about a thousand people a day seeing our booth. So that, that is a huge thing because we are trying to build our organization and we're more interested in that. See, knife throwing, there's, you don't really get paid for knife throwing. Right. You win. 
people don't realize that uh, there's, it's not really a sport per se. It has not been a sport that is good for professionals because the word professional means you're getting paid. It's an amateur sport until we came along. Uh, Melody and I, in the last two years, were the first ones who started offering in, uh, I think 15 years ago they did, but uh, two years ago we started paying people when they win. So we started offering cash prizes. And we were able to do that by getting sponsors involved, something that hasn't been done. Um, because knife throwing is a brand, pretty much, it's an old sport. It's been around forever. Mm -hmm. uh, but it hasn't been commercially uh, promoted. One, because people think knife throwing are for crazy people. You know, it's dangerous. Everybody's throwing knives. But like you saw when you came over, the knives aren't sharp. And it's about understanding rotation. It's about as dangerous as throwing darts. Except but you are throwing at a target. It's sticking at a target. target. Yeah, you're not throwing around people, you know, <laughs> unless you want to. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you're throwing around a wooden target. And everything is uh, standardized. We have specific sizes for the targets. It's not random. Uh, uh, there's a specific distance that you throw from. And we have very specific rules. And then, of course, the axe throwing is the same. So all the sports that we're doing uh, with the Blade Aces uh, organization is standardized because our actual goal is to make it into the Olympics for knife throwing. Okay, and it, it, there's always new games being added on all the time. Yeah. I mean, well, I don't know how many Olympics ago when they added like curling uh, for, yeah. for, in, the, in, the, in the Winter Olympics. Yes, I so. don't understand a large <laughs> rock being, and then some guy who's a janitor, very fast janitor who sweeps, you know. <laughs> so, but it, he's never, because uh, there's, uh, there's new sports being added on all the time. Now, I'm going to give a, 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 a little shout out to your wife. Uh, I, I, we didn't ask you about this before, but I, I know your wife is a very good knife thrower. Uh, how is she ranked? As uh, Melody is an 11-time world champion. She's the highest ranked female knife thrower in the world. Uh, not only is she very good at knife throwing, anybody who's met her will tell you she's probably the most, she is the most humble knife thrower out there. Uh, she throws wearing a dress, sometimes in full, you know, Western wear with the hoop skirts, etc. cetera. Uh, and she, she, she does not, she, she throws with a lot of finesse and she's very, very accurate. In fact, a lot of the European men are quite happy that there's a separate women's division because if she was competing in the men's division, there would be hell to pay because she is that good. And now with the, with the different divisions, if I understand it correctly, it's like women's golf. Women tee off from a different tee uh, in golf. So the same thing with women uh, that have a women's division. She has to play by their rules, which are not as restrictive as the men's rules. No, so. actually, they throw from the same distance. They oh, do, do the they? exact same thing. But she competes with women, which makes no sense. That's why they're trying to uh, – here in the United States, we don't have a women's division. Okay, so the women compete with the men, and she's ranked, she's up there, she's in the expert level, uh, as well as myself. We're actually the highest ranked knife throwing couple because we're the only ones who are husband and wife who are in the expert level, uh, and we're both master instructors. So um, in Europe, however, they have a women's division. They have the exact same rules as the men. You throw from the exact same distances. You do pretty much everything, but they don't want the women competing with the men. Okay, kind of like men's and women's gymnastics or men's and women's skiing or men's and they, they're yeah, but with that, with those sports, there's a there's almost a handicap given to the woman. Mm -hmm. in, in knife throwing, there is no handicap given to the women. It's the same distances, uh, so we don't understand why there's such a why you even need a women's and men's division if it wasn't just because of the male ego. You know, mm -hmm. saying, I don't want a woman kicking my butt because she would, <laughs> in most cases, she would. <laughs> okay, well, that's, that's cool because so that was all about uh, uh, Blade Aces. Now, the Superhero Foundry, why did you start that? I mean, was it to, it was originally for children, wasn't it? Or for, for, for youths, not necessarily children. Oh, uh, we, we started it because, um, well, one of the biggest reasons why we started it was because we started, no, we, we noticed that martial arts in general is, are starting to become more and more commercialized and less realistic. Um, people are spending way too much time trying to do things that would be considered uh, gymnastic. Like for example, XMA, extreme martial arts, where they're doing flips and they're, they're spinning around these, these, these bokens. I mean, these, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, they're using bokens, they're using bow staffs that are pretty much made of light pine so they can spin it very, very fast. It was more focused towards uh, looking 
dangerous as opposed to being able to use a martial art that can be used for self-defense. Uh, and it's because of martial arts going that way, two other martial arts develop, MMA, okay, and you have Krav Maga. Now, MMA is a sport also, but it's one-on-one, -on -one, you're in the ring, and most people are familiar with the UFC and how that's developed. And then you have Krav Maga, which is, they, they, they say it's a self-defense where it's realistic, hit, 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 punch, 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 kill, kill, kill. It's a lot about aggression. So Superhero Foundry is the bridge between the commercialized martial arts where it looks so fancy, and then the martial arts where you're literally trying to pummel somebody to death. We find that if you teach something that's not realistic, it's useless. It's all for fun. It might as well take dance, okay? Mm -hmm. And if you teach something that's gonna be killing someone, you're going to jail. So the Superhero Foundry, the way that we've developed our martial art, we call it Weapon X. It stands for Weapon Extraction or Weapon Destruction. And the number one weapon a human being has is the human arm. So we believe that, and we've proven time and time again, that if I break a person's hand, they can't grab me, they can't stab me, they can't shoot me, they can't, do, punch, they can't punch me. The hand is completely useless. If I break your elbow or shoulder, same effect. However, I can't kill you. So if I broke your hand as you're throwing a punch at me, when the officer comes, and they will, the police will come, and you explain, why did you break his hand? Your answer is, because he was hitting me. I needed to stop him. I believed that my life was in danger and I needed to protect myself. So it's 100% self-defense. However, if somebody were throwing a punch, I parried their hand and I struck them in the face or neck, they fell backwards, hit their head on a sidewalk, it can be, they could, they could say it's assault, pure assault. Why, would, why did you punch him in the face? You try to knock him out, you try to kill him. The prosecuting attorney will turn the tables on me being the defender and make it sound as if I, was, I had premeditated the attack. Hmm. But if I hurt somebody's arm, how can you say that that was premeditated? The only reason you hurt somebody's arm is because they stuck it at you. Therefore, assault was perpetrated by the person who stuck their arm out. And this is because we have lawyers mm -hmm. uh, in our business. And when I discussed this with them, they said, that's pretty much genius because you're covered when it comes to what you're doing. So it's effective because we're hitting a simple target. The hand is a very, very fragile you know, part of your body. Our fingers, wrists, et cetera, they're yes. fragile bones. It's effective. It's efficient because you don't waste a lot of time. It's, it's non-lethal because I technically can't kill you by breaking your arm. And the last is legal because we discuss a lot about, we talk about the legality <laughs> of carrying knives, using weapons, uh, even uh, where you're striking. Uh, because a person who teaches martial arts without explaining to your students the legality of the act, the rules of how it operates, let's just say that. You know how to shoot it, but you're not, you don't know what the repercussions are of you shooting someone. So we have to teach the legal portion. In addition to that, we also teach first aid, CPR, everything else about how to, you know, uh, service the community, say that. So there's a lot in what we do that seems so much more than just martial arts. And because, and it's, a, it's, an, it's a very serendipitous that we're right next door to a comic book store. So yes, when <laughs> we, yeah, so when my wife and I were, came in here and we were looking at this, we're like, wow, this is, this is actually, this is serendipitous, you know? Mm -hmm. We're trying to do a superhero kind of system, and we're next to our comic book store. I mean, this is a great, this is, this is you know, there's that, that, that synergy going on. So that's what it, that's how we ended up with a superhero foundry. Okay, okay. And I, and I know for, uh, on a personal note that uh, my best, one of my closest friends, her name is Nicole, she's yeah. uh, in the past has had a superhero event for a few years. And if the last couple of years you were able to attend, attend the event, and you even came as Deadpool. So Yes, yes, I did. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, and, and Nicole Zegler, um, she's, she's awesome. And uh, as a matter of fact, one of her buttons uh, is, uh, what's your superpower? It actually hangs on our Deadpool guy here. Uh, <laughs> and we actually use that. Uh, I told her that we're going to use that. When we, that's one of our taglines is, what's your superpower? Because we believe that everyone has a superpower. So why not find out what it is? And in a way, it also brings a person's self-confidence to play. Because, like I said, it's about fulfilling 
the needs of the people who are we service. Okay, it's about what do they want. It's not what we want to teach them. It's what are their needs, and when we figure out what their powers are, okay, what their their strengths are, and what their weaknesses are, we can pretty much custom fit something that'll that'll jive with their life and their lives. It's something that'll fit with their lifestyle, and now it becomes a personal thing. It's no longer oh I do martial arts. They go oh I'm discovering myself. You see, so by fulfilling your clients' needs and by giving them what they need and still stay within our mission parameters, uh, it's a win-win situation. And that's what we're going for. It's a win-win situation. And that's, that's good advice, not only in martial arts, but also in just in business in general yes, when, you're, yes. when you're taking on clients. So that's a, I'm glad you said something like that. That's phenomenal advice. Um, so what I'm going to do here, I'm going to just um, turn, the, turn the tide a little bit. We're going to go into more of personal stuff uh, that, that, that I'd normally cover in the show. Um, first of all, I want to go over, over how many years have you been as tribal advantages or how, how long has that been around or how long have your other two sub businesses been around? Uh, the tribal advantage has been around, I think we started in 2012. Uh, we started from a dance studio and from there we were building clients. Uh, prior to that, I had a dance and martial arts studio with my ex-wife and that was since 2005. So technically, uh, I've been teaching martial arts in the United States since around 2005, 2004. Uh, so, and prior to that, of course, I, I've been in martial arts since 1976. So it, it's been a it's been a long process, and it's it's been very very uh, entertaining. <laughs> and could you could you tell us about uh, your your company, some of the, your early successes when we were just getting started? What were some things that you may not have thought was going to happen, or what were some like maybe how you got your first clients or or, or something along those lines? First clients, uh, I started very small. I wanted to make sure my overhead was very, very low. Uh, I started teaching at a local gymnastics studio called Gym Cats in Henderson. Uh, they, we had a couple of students, two or three students that I was teaching on the side prior going there. So they, uh, when we were doing practice, the other kids would walk by and they would see what we were doing. They would be interested and it grew. Uh, then we moved to a, a large, much larger location uh, off Las Vegas Boulevard in Silverado Ranch. So location, location, location. Now, that was great because uh, uh, with my ex-wife, we had the dance department and we had the martial arts department. And we found that if you have a business that does is not single-minded in its approach, we had martial arts and we had dance. So they worked off each other because the little girls had brothers. The little brothers would see the martial arts, they would join that, while the sisters would take the dance. Then the parents would be sitting there doing nothing. So then we started including salsa dancing in a third classroom. So then they were interested. So that way we just didn't take uh, one child, but two kids, and then the parents. So now it worked in that way. Um, I try to, with my business, be very careful about being single-minded or a single stream of income. Uh, if you have a single stream of income, something goes wrong and you've got a major headache. Uh, for example, our business right now, we're launching, we're preparing to launch our online academy. I have several clients of mine who are in special forces and uh, several clients of mine who are in other countries, including England and France, et cetera, who are fans of my, and again, it stems from one to another, success creates success. In the YouTube channel that I've created, we've had people who have uh, sent me messages saying, hey, I wish you were, you had a location here. I said, it's kind of difficult to do. So again, I started small. So what I'm doing is I'm creating an online academy. And my online academy is, has a series of videos that address all the different aspects we have. We simplify it. Uh, we make the, the videos very short, seven minutes or less, uh, and teaching only one lesson at a piece. Uh, it's uh, through a drip system where uh, when somebody subscribes, they pay a monthly due. And then they uh, see a certain number of videos per month. And based on how long they stay on, they get more and more videos. So we have the online uh, academy. Uh, we're also working on our online store, our web store. Uh, we have our local martial arts studio that we do here. Uh, we have the knife throwing. So having the multiple forms of sources of income came as it, it, it wasn't something I planned originally, not to this extent, but it's starting to build on each other. Uh, like I said, success creates more success. So when something looks good, we go with it. If something's not so good, we stick with it for a little while. And if it peters out and we decide, okay, this isn't working, I guess get rid of it. I guess get rid of it. I'm not going to stick around and you know beat a dead horse, this is the point mm -hmm. of phrase. 
Uh, if it's not working, I'm just going to abandon it. And some people will go, oh, why don't you stick around doing it? And I usually say, well, there's only one of you. <laughs> and the opinion of one person is not going to change my mind. I need a, a good number of people to do it. Uh, there, there's a lot to be said about being persistent in a goal, but there's also a lot to be said about being stupid and just throwing money at something and hoping it, it fixes itself. So, uh, also because in the past I worked, like I said, I worked at Cirque du Soleil, uh, and my, uh, my connections to that group, uh, I was also a member of the Chinese American Citizens Alliance, which I was a member, I was, uh, I was the marshal. Uh, so being involved in theater and acting plus being involved in politics and local political organizations and uh, working as a uh, working with other nonprofits and helping them out including Semper Fi with the US Marines uh, uh, with Goody Two Shoes it's another group that we deal we work with uh, they're, they're wonderful people they uh, uh, Nikki Birdie they uh, do uh, shoes for kids here mm -hmm. for, uh, and uh, other groups there's, there's uh, quite a few other groups that we deal with also by working with them, we can ask them for help whenever we have our, you know, our events. So it's that creating a community. And that is something that a lot of businesses I see don't want to explore. They stay to themselves. And if you, if you stay to yourself, you're not really, no one's hearing about you. you. You need to get out there and let other people know. And you need to, it's like, People don't care what you know until they know that you care, you know, right. that, that cliche. So we give and give and give and give, and hopefully we get something in return. If we don't, big deal. That's the reason why we call ourselves superheroes, you know, doing things without asking for something back. But when we do, it's usually something that's substantial because the people do it out of, and they understand that we're doing it out of the goodness of our heart, and it's not something that, that we're looking for a profit. Uh, because we usually just want something like, Hey, mention us on your, on your, on your podcast <laughs> 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 or mention us on a commercial or something. We're fine with that because, uh, like I say, you do good things for people. Good things happen back. Okay. And that's, that's very good because I'm, I'm a strong believer of that as well by giving unconditionally. Um, it, op it opens up the flood gates. Like we just, you could call it just karma that would just to come back, but you didn't, but which you, but you're not doing it to get something back. You're doing it just for the good of others. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. Well then, to, uh, then let me ask you about what were some of you as a beginning entrepreneur in these businesses, what were some of your fears? What were some of the things that you were afraid, like, you know, that, that you were thought that might happen that either didn't happen or that you overcame that did happen? Well, one of the biggest things we had is that this is a bootstrap. We started uh, really on a shoestring budget. Uh, it wasn't something that we had a large budget to come into. And they said the number one reason that people fail with their businesses is that uh, lack of capital. Uh, that's a huge thing. And I think the second one, I believe, is lack of business acumen. Business acumen I had. Uh, I've always been in business. I've always thought of ways of making money, even as a child. But um, my biggest, <laughs> some, some more illegal than others. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, for like the, the protection business, but, uh, <laughs> but for the most part, um, the things that we really feared about is that we would of course be in the wrong location, uh, not have enough people hear about us, et cetera. But I soon realized that my old studio, when we opened, um, we didn't have advertising and, you know, back in early two thousands, you don't have the internet. We didn't have the internet. Now with social media, it's so much easier. Mm -hmm. I can put so I can put a post out, and in a matter of minutes, it can be listened. Uh, like over uh, over ten thousand people can see it because it'll be shared by my friends, and their friends share it. And my 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 uh, my uh, audience is much bigger. That's why the whole online academy makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. I concentrate my business only here in Vegas. I only have Vegas, but. On an online academy through YouTube and everything else, with the exposure of what we do, and that's the reason why my wife and I travel so much. We go to different countries, like the Philippines, etc. Uh, you know, and like I said, all through Europe. The reason we travel all, all over the United States is because we want people to see our face as the face of knife throwing. Uh, something that uh, the branding, the branding is very important. So we were worried that maybe you know. Uh, there's always that worry that what you're doing is you don't have enough money to be able to do it. But we overcame that by work. It's just work, really, really crazy work ethic. 
uh, you go to, you don't go to bed late and you wake up early. Uh, you put in more time than anybody else. You do research. You study. Uh, I mean, I'm 52 years old. My gray hairs are starting to show up now. Yeah, I'm saying uh, that. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, oh, man. Uh, but uh, for the longest time, everybody thought I was 35. That's because I was coloring my hair. But uh, <laughs> and my wife is 17 years younger than me. So, But, but the, when you, you start looking at how the world functions nowadays, if you stick to the old ways, you get the old results. You know? Uh, like I said, Gary Vaynerchuk is a huge influence uh, with me uh, for me because I've seen how he uses social media so much and he's so passionate about what he does. So uh, he's definitely, even he doesn't know it because I don't know the man <laughs> personally, was definitely a mentor to me because I listen to everything he says. Uh, and he says things from the heart. He has things with passion. He doesn't sugarcoat things. and He speaks the way he speaks. He doesn't try to sound uh, intelligent or, or, or not that he's not intelligent because the man is extremely intelligent. He doesn't try to sound uh, um, fake. All right. He, he actually does what he says. And I believe I've always been told by my parents that uh, reputation is more important than money. So as long as that reputation is strong and people understand that what you're doing is for the right reasons, people will show up. You know, so even though we had those fears, I can't say I didn't have fears. But I didn't let those fears hold me back. Especially those fears are what spurred me on. Was when I got worried at something, to me, like I said, uh, and you hear that cliche, fears are a fear, false evidence appearing real. But to me, a fear is just an obstacle because everything great is always on the other side of that fear. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. because uh, if you're not challenging yourself, and, you, and which a challenge usually means there's going to be a fear involved, uh, if you're not doing that, then everything is 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 a give me. Then yeah, there's there's no there's no inspiration there. It's just like, hey, let's uh, let's go play football with a, a, a whole bunch of elementary school kids, and we get an yeah. NFL team out there. It's like, you know, that's it's, it doesn't challenge you at all. So yeah, and in martial arts, actually, was a great motivator for me as a teacher for that because in the martial arts, for example, when you're breaking a board, everybody looks at that board and try to hit it, you bust your hand, but you have to look past the board. You have to break the board to get through it. And when you're facing an opponent across the ring and you're about to fight, you know, I don't know this guy. I have no idea what skill, his skill levels are. I don't know if he's going to beat me up, but until I step in that ring, I'll never know. So that fear, you had to face it every single time. And having done that thousands, literally thousands of times, you know, uh, whether it's live stick fights where I know I'm going to get injured or I've even had knife fights in the Philippines, which it's suicidal, it's stupid to do. Uh, but facing that fear is an important aspect of having a successful business. Because if you're afraid to move forward, you're going to stay exactly where you are. And you may even fall back. So I believe that's one of the big reasons that um, a lot of businesses that I know of uh, have failed because they're afraid to extend themselves with other people because they're afraid people are going to steal their stuff. If they steal their stuff, they steal their stuff. Big deal. You yeah. build your own business. I, I concentrate on what I'm doing. Uh, we look at other businesses. Other businesses have popped up here in Vegas, you know, who say that they're the first knife throwing and axe throwing place in Vegas, which is a total lie because I can prove it with my business license, you know? <laughs> It's like, okay, and they've actually called me and asked me to teach their students. And I'm thinking, I've never heard of Pepsi calling Coca-Cola for the recipe. Mm -hmm. But it happens, you know. Uh, they'll lie. They'll publish out there. But, you know, to me, they build their business. They're more commercial. I have professionals coming to me. The professionals come to me. They'll, they'll drive in from San Diego for an hour just to train with me. Or people have come in from India to train with me, for goodness sake, you know. We've had people who... Who, uh, who, who are professional magicians come in. I mean, we have people, David Blaine, for goodness sake, we cut a cigar out of his mouth, for goodness sake. That was like, <laughs> that was, we're just sitting around for 16 hours and get paid us two grand. I mean, it's, it's, it's a wonderful experience to be able to go with these big guys who hear about us. And just because we're doing what we do best and we love what we do, it attracts all the right people. And like I said, in it's in it's building, it's building, and like I said, success builds success. And it's not that we're so lucky that these things are happening; it's because I'm ignoring all this, the the negative stuff. <laughs> I'm literally ignoring all the failures, because with every success, there were ten failures prior to that. And if I concentrate on the failures, it's overwhelming. But you I learn just, from your failures. 
uh, yeah, you learn from your failures, but once I'm done with those failures, I concentrate on that success. And that success is what spurs me on. I'm like, yeah, I succeeded. Great. Let's move on. Okay. Because it's never a failure until you quit. That is true. That is true. And that is, that is so true. Yeah. And you, you've, you've given some great, great advice there. I mean, even for your studio as well as for um, just people in general, um, that, that is, that is phenomenal. Thanks. Uh, um, now, let me ask you, what do you see yourself in like the next 12 to 24 months? Well, yeah, this is uh, 2018 is going to be very, very, very uh, lucrative, let's just say, for us. Um, we have the two TV shows that are being filmed. Uh, we have another TV commercial that's being filmed about us. When I come back from Texas, uh, we're going on a boar hunt. I think I told you that earlier. Uh, we're, not, we're not shooting boring people. We're sh <laughs> but it's, like I said, it's stretching ourselves beyond uh, our comfort level. My wife has never gone boar hunting, so we're going to do that. Uh, we do a lot of exciting things. Uh, we have tournaments to go to, my daughter's uh, graduation to go to. I think that's exciting because she's, she's uh, graduating from high school. Uh, Wow, there's a lot. We're going to the Philippines. We're going to do the Sturgis thing. We, I, there's too much. So this Sturgis thing, that's out of curiosity, what do, you, what do you look to gain from that? Is it more of your online training programs? Is that what you could be promoting out there? Or there, there are three different things that we're going for with Sturgis. Number one, of course, is the money aspect because we'll be running a booth where we have five lanes of knife throwing and people will be throwing and we have, you know, what we charge for that. That's, that's a big money maker for us. But number two, what we're going for is more memberships for bladeaces.org, our company, uh, our, our, our organization. Because everybody who signs up for these tournaments, um, uh, they become members. This automatic become a member. So we can grow a membership to over 1,000 members in one weekend, which is terrific. Uh, the largest knife throwing organization in the world like now, I believe it may be uh, – International Knife Throwers Hall of Fame, which my wife is the, on the board of directors for, and I used to be a member of. Um, I think they have a close to 550. I can do 1,000 in a weekend. Uh, like I said, I aim high. Uh, and then um, the third aspect, of course, is the online academy because people can go online and learn how to throw knives by watching a video. Um, you would think it would be impossible, but with the proper uh, use of different cameras. And you know, Kevin, we're in the, we're in the film industry. Yeah. And uh, I have, I have uh, done a lot of research on where camera angles need to be so people will learn everything from the use of slow-mo to close-ups to cutaways. It, I, can do, I can do a video better when it comes to knife throwing than anybody I know of. Why? Because I just have more experience when it comes to being behind the camera and being in front of the camera. So having that knowledge uh, and having great trainers like my friend Pat Kirby and others who I've sat behind a camera and worked with, uh, it's increased my repertoire. Um, uh, a friend of mine who was in the special forces once told me every skill you learn doubles your chances of success. So I like to learn. It's, it's a learning process for me. My doctorate degree is in dentistry, you know, <laughs> which it, it's kind of funny that I'm in martial arts, but I was in dentistry before, but it's always about learning more and more and more and more and more. It's, it's a never ending process at 52 years old. I'm still learning every, every day I'm learning something new. I never stop learning. That's, that's, a, that's a great, that's a great thing. Yeah. Okay. And um, I guess as we're wrapping up here, are, is there any entrepreneurial tidbits or life lessons or upbeat moments that you'd like to share with the audience before we, before we depart? Yeah. Um, the, uh, my, my belief or my wife and I, our belief is that you always go through life looking at the positive. If you, if you plan that, if you're thinking that it's going to go wrong, it will, it, you, you get what you expect. Um, I'm supposed to be doing a pretty much a, a, a type of Ted talks uh, with a, with a hero round table. And uh, that has been delayed last year to this year it's been delayed but i believe there's a reason for that that by the time i actually have my schedule lined up where i can go i would have more experience to be able to convey to the people who are listening so every setback is not really a setback it just gives you more time to prepare so every failure you know if you look at it oh my gosh i failed yeah it's going to become a failure because you just stop learning take the failures that that happen because they will happen uh and look at what did I do right, what did I do wrong, and learn from it. That's the same lesson that we have in knife throwing. What did I do right, what did I do wrong? Was my grip wrong? Was my distance wrong? Was I aligned wrong? You know, and what was I doing right? And I did that better 
that I believe most is because I had three cameras filming me from all sides. So not only do you learn from what you, your mistakes, you need people or machines to observe what you're doing. So you always have to get that feedback. So don't be afraid to get feedback from, you know, from good critiques. Uh, don't don't ask people who hate you. Uh, sometimes well, you could, you could, sometimes that could be good as well. Sometimes it could be good too, you know, uh, because they they tell you things that sometimes they tell you things. It's it's kind of hard though because you don't know if what they're telling you is something to improve you. It's because they're jealous of you or because they want you to fail, you know. Uh, so it it's sort of you have to understand human nature, and probably that is the number one thing that I can give is to understand human nature. Uh, the more you understand how people think and how they process and their motivations in life will help you not just in business and in life, but in definitely in a martial arts defensive uh, perspective also. Because what's one of the huge things that I train when I teach people, if you know the motivation of your attacker, you know how to defeat them. So it's the same thing. If you know the motivation of your buyer, you know how to sell to them. Mm -hmm. So that's it, in a, you know. That's good advice. Thank you. I've never heard it put that way before because obviously people are coming to you. They're looking for solutions to the problems that they have. It could be confidence. It could be uh, any of a number of things. And that's exactly what you provide. Yes. Yeah. So uh, TJ, uh, if the audience wanted to get a hold of you, uh, is there, I know you say you're working on your website and I'm not exactly sure when this show is actually going to be launched. Um, so your website could be up and running or fully up and running by the time the show is launched. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what is a, a good way for them to get a hold of you? Uh, they can reach us at superherofoundry.com. Superhero Foundry? Oh, superherofoundry.com. Or so Blade Aces. Yeah, or there's another one. It's bladeaces.org if they're interested in the knife throwing. Uh, but yeah, superherofoundry.com. Okay. And and this on, on the online program, is that going to be through Superhero Foundry or is that going to be another site in itself? There's a link to that site. So that way they don't have to think about too many things. But Superhero Foundry will link to everything else. Uh, we also have our telephone number, which is 702-907-X-MEN. <laughs> you got that number. You actually got that number. <laughs> yes, I've got that number. <laughs> <laughs> 907 wow. X-Men, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Okay, well, TJ, I do appreciate you being on the show. I think you gave us some great advice. I'm so glad we reconnected. I mean, we, haven't, we need to do lunch again before, yeah, maybe right. after your yeah. boar hunt or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and um, it was great having you on the show. And anything else you want to say to the audience before we say goodbye? Um, yeah, yeah, this idea to join the heroic revolution, be a hero, do something in your uh, community that uh, – that sets you different from everybody else and uh, just keep going until you reach it. You know, like I say, say uh, set your goals high and you don't stop until you get there. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, TJ. All right. Well, everybody, that was uh, TJ and with the Superhero Foundry. If you like this show, just go ahead and leave a comment below. Or if you're on iTunes, just go ahead and leave us a, a four or five star, actually a five star review. Ask for, the, ask, ask for, ask for it all, right, TJ? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and uh, if you want to see more of these shows, you can go to my, my website at kevinadunlap.com. TJ, thank you for being on the show today. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Okay, bye now. Bye -bye. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Life's Little Lessons with your host, author of Designing Your Own Destiny, Kevin A. Dunlap. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit kevinadunlap.com, facebook.com slash kevinadunlap.author, and on Twitter at kevinadunlap. We'll catch you on the next episode of Life's Little Lessons.